Thanks for downloading the Look Away Now podcast from BBC Radio 4. If you want to find out more, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. But not until you've enjoyed Look Away Now. Thank you very much and welcome to Look Away Now, the show that mixes sport and comedy a bit like Ricky Ponting's face. <laughs> Mark Webber won the German Grand Prix at the weekend, despite colliding with Rubens Barrichello at the start. Webber was given a drive through penalty, which meant he had to complete the rest of the race with a cheeseburger on his lap. <laughs> at the Tour de France, sprinter Mark Cavendish is still in the hunt for the green jersey. He should try and remember where he had it last and work back from there. <laughs> That's how I found my Spider-Man pyjamas. <laughs> Carlos Tevez is signed for Manchester City. Tevez becomes part of a very select group of players to have played for both Manchester clubs, but then he's also part of an even more select group of people to be called Rooney's Ugly Friend. <laughs> England batsman Paul Collingwood was praised for batting for nearly six hours to help save the first Ashes test in Cardiff. He said it was vital to stay at the crease for as long as he could, as there's sod all else to do in South Wales on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Referring to their apparent attempt to waste time, the Australian captain, Ricky Ponting, accused England of pretty ordinary tactics, which for England is high praise indeed. <laughs> well, as the teams prepare for the second test, that starts tomorrow morning, I'm delighted now to be joined on the line by England's star batsman, Kevin Peterson. Um, Kevin, welcome to the show. Hello, Kerry. Uh, get, get, I'm using a telephone. <laughs> Uh, so, so, Kevin, that first test may have been a draw, but one side will have left Cardiff, obviously, feeling very frustrated. Uh, the other feeling like they've, they've got out of jail. Uh, absolutely, Gary. Look, no question about that. Us, us England boys really have to hold our hands up and say that if it hadn't been for that bit of rain on the Saturday, we would definitely have won the match. <laughs> Don't you mean lost the match? What game of cricket were you watching, Gary? In, in case you hadn't noticed, when the match ended, we were ahead. <laughs> By 13 runs. And if the Aussies had batted again, I reckon we'd have got them all out for no more than three. Mm. In fact, I wanted Straussy to declare once the lead hit double figures. <laughs> I kept telling him and telling him, but then the team doctor gave me a vitamin injection and I don't remember much after that. <laughs> Let's talk about your two dismissals in the match. In the first innings, you looked in complete control, and then you tried to sweep a ball two feet outside your off stump and dollied up a catch to short leg. Kevin, I have to say, that was a ludicrous way to get out. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was an idiotic shot. That, that's how I play, Gary. Like an idiot. <laughs> so, so you're actually proud of getting out like that? In a way, Gary, I mean, I, I absolutely hate getting out, obviously, but when it does happen, I like my dismissals to be as unique and memorable as the rest of my family. In fact, my only regret is that I didn't make it really ludicrous by, I don't know, hitting the ball up my own bottom and then passing it straight to second slip. <laughs> So, moving on to the second innings, then, um, you elected to leave a ball that was heading straight for your off stump. Uh, what were you thinking there? Less is more. <laughs> Sorry? Well, it, it was going to be very hard to cap my first innings dismissal, so I was thinking to myself, Kevin, why not go the other way? P pull it back, rein it in, less is more. And by the time I'd finished thinking all that, Hilton House had run in and bowled me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Kevin, uh, let's move on. Um, there were reports that you and the Australian fast bowler Mitchell Johnson exchanged some heated words in the nets on Sunday morning. Um, what happened there? Uh, it, it was nothing, really, Gary. I, I was doing some batting practice and I, and I hit a ball near where he was fielding and he said to me, watch it, Peterson. And I said to him, watch what, Johnson? Your watch? Shall I watch your watch? Because if, if you want me to watch your watch, I'll watch your watch. I watch your watch so hard your watch will wish it was some kind of pudding. <laughs> I, I think we can all see who got the better mm. of that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, finally, let me ask you this. How confident are you that England will put in a better performance in the second test? I am a 158 million percent confident that will happen. <laughs> which, for me, isn't all that confident, actually. <laughs> in fact, for me, that equates to I'm absolutely bricking it. <laughs> oh, dear, I think Kevin Peterson needs to give Kevin Peterson a special mm. hug. Well, <laughs> since I'm slightly worried as to what that will involve, Kevin, I, th I think we'd better leave it there. Thank you for joining us. OK, guys. Go now, this year's Formula One championship has suddenly become as wide open as a packet of pork scratchings on Mike Ashley's desk. <laughs> Jensen Button's earlier dominance has given way to a free-for-all. Is it pleasing unpredictability or massive conspiracy? 
Well, I'll give you a clue. Our massive conspiracy correspondent, <laughs> Lawrence Howarth, joins me. Um, Lawrence, what's going on? Well, Gary, my suspicions were first aroused when, completely out of the blue, Formula One got interesting. <laughs> And when I tried to find out why, I opened up a Pandora's gearbox of bad motor racing. <laughs> what do you mean, exactly? It's all to do with the car allocation system. Mm. But that's all sorted out in advance of the World Championship. Um, surely teams don't allocate their cars on a race-by-race -race basis? Well, let's make one thing clear, Gary. Race doesn't come into it. Uh, if this was a simple matter of racism, we could blame the Spanish and move on. No, it, it's... <laughs> It's time to forget everything you think you know about Formula One. Well, that shouldn't take long, to be honest. <laughs> there is no such thing as teams. They're all just make-believe, like professional wrestling or Peter Beardsley. The, car <laughs> the cars are all built by the governing body to various different specifications and then dealt out completely at random. What? They used to do it at the start of each season. All the keys were tossed into a big bowl, like at a, like at a giant swingers party, only one at which Nigel Manson was actually welcome. <laughs> you picked out your car and you were stuck with it for the year. But after Braun got lucky with the keys at the start of this championship and the whole thing began to turn into the usual procession, some bright spark had the idea of holding a car draw before every race, and it's caused havoc. Mm. And do you have proof of this? Well, of course I have. Listen to this, recorded at the car allocation before the German Grand Prix. Right, settle down. <clears throat> OK, Jensen Button. OK, come on, come on, come on. You shall be driving... ..number 22, the one that's good on the straight bits but rubbish at the corners. Oh, bloody hell! <laughs> Lewis Hamilton, you shall get... Come on, come on. ..number one, the clown car. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. You see... That's staggering, Lawrence. I, I can scarcely believe what I've heard. That's nothing, Gary. They used to allocate cars based on how good the drivers were at children's party games. Uh, for years, Michael Schumacher only got the fastest car because of a preternatural ability to locate a donkey's bottom whilst blindfolded. <laughs> Lawrence Howard, thank you very much indeed. Mitchell Johnson bowls now to the England captain and Strauss hits it straight back up. Oh, he's out! Caught there by Paul Collingwood. At the non-striker's end. Surely that's treason. <laughs> if you like out-of-shape athletes hitting tiny balls with big sticks, you'll love golf. <laughs> the 2009 Open Championship starts tomorrow in England's very own Scotland. For those... <laughs> For those unfamiliar with the Turnberry course, we've made a handy guide to the holes. The first hole at Turnbury is slightly too small for a golf ball to fit in. <laughs> Having reached the hole, the golfers will have to bash it in using the putter like a mallet. The fourth hole is affectionately known by the caddies as Tom the Wee Firth Hole, on account of them never having met a real Scotsman. <laughs> Hole 18 is circular. It's either a par 1 or a par 9, depending on which way you're facing. <laughs> Make sure to enter the 10th hole with care, for it is the dominion of Golfbot, a state-of-the-art robotic caddy who's gone rogue. <laughs> the 7th hole doubles as a busy local salsa bar called El Hoyo Sieta. <laughs> the 9th hole is the most famous at Turnbury because it played Officer Dibble in the long-running cartoon Top Cat. <laughs> Well, it's time now for our music in sport correspondent, Richie Webb. Um, Richie, what have you been looking at this week? Well, Gary, apparently in this country, one person in every six is obese. Well, there's six of us here, so, so logically, one of us... Yeah, is... stop looking at me like that, Gary. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm not actually obese. Technically, I'm clinically jolly. <laughs> Anyway, this week I've been writing songs for people who want to start getting fit to listen to on their iPods whilst they exercise. Here's a song for first-time joggers. And we're off. Straight away you've started too quick. Keep up this speed and you're going to be sick. And if you're getting strange looks from strangers, stop wearing wellies and buy proper trainers. Jog, jog, jog. Together we'll shape and tone. Jog, jog, jog. No, you can't take the next bus home. <laughs> 
If an old lady overtakes you with a shopping, it's probably time to think about stopping. Just try to make your involuntary retching look like a complicated bit of stretching. And jog, 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 it's only bile, don't worry. Jog, 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 let's celebrate with beer and a curry. <laughs> I have to say, Richie, that was very reassuring. Exactly. Just helps ease those fears, doesn't it? Now, first-time visitors to the gym should pop this little ditty onto their iPod. Purposefully stride to the exercise machine Doing a half-baked warm-up routine The equipment instructions are very confusing And so you are left with quite serious bruising Jump on the treadmill at a sensible pace Press the wrong button, end up flat on your face. <laughs> the weights machine is worth a quick punt, except that you've sat down in it back to front. <laughs> Choosing the right weight's a hard thing to do. Go with your gut instinct, then divide by two. <laughs> Heave it up, one, two, three, go and pop. There's your hernia saying hello <laughs> at the gym. If you're lacking inspiration to get thinner There's a fat, sweaty bloke staring back at you from the mirror <laughs> At the gym <laughs> uh, Rich, a question? Yep. Have you ever been to the gym? I saw one on the telly once. Anyway, <laughs> cycling is another great way to ease yourself back into the world of exercise. And with my personal music trainer, or PMT for short, on your iPod, you'll soon be brimming with confidence. You need to look the part, of course, but I'm guessing you won't fit in lycra shorts. So jeans in socks is the look we're after. Ignore other road users' gales of laughter. Perch on the seat, sharp as a knife edge. Comfortably arrange your meat and to veg. <laughs> Sorry if that sounds too graphic. But you can't mess around with them whilst negotiating traffic. <laughs> Push away from the curb and we're off. Actually, first switch your iPod off. You shouldn't really listen while cycling. Sorry, you need to concentrate and look out for that lorry! <laughs> Richie Webb, ladies and gentlemen. Richie Webb. Well, time now for some live action. You've all heard cricket commentary on Radio 4's Test Match special. It's like a cross between farming today and book at bedtime. <laughs> well, here at Look Away Now, we've got our own commentary team, but because we couldn't get the rights to any live cricket, this week they've taken their outside broadcast van to a child's birthday party. So let's dip into a bit of birthday party special with your commentary team of the former Australian all-rounder, Glenn Shane, and the one-time Dorset captain, STD de Glanville. <laughs> But uh, the fact remains, Glenn, that no matter which way you look at it, submarines do not have chimneys. <laughs> that is not how they roll. And the birthday boy Billy really gives that one a lot of air. And as a result, his balloon disappears over the fence. <laughs> Oh, look, it was a slip of the tongue, STD. You don't need to keep banging on about it, mate. Oh, can try, Glenn, because if the tables were turned, you would be uh, giving... Uh, and here's uh, little Tommy running away from our commentary position now to play on his own in the sandpit. And there's no fun. <laughs> so he comes back again. You would be giving me plenty. Yeah, I think we've kind of lost sight of the point I was originally trying to make, STD, which was that this kid's party is like a submarine. You know there's trouble heading your way, but you don't quite know where it's coming from yet. Oh, well, now, this, this is the last thing we need. Some idiot has invaded the playing area. Um, who is this clown? <laughs> That's Bobo the Clown, mate. <laughs> and he's a terrific entertainer, this man. Some people call him a pie-slinger, which, of course, he is. <laughs> but he's also much more than that. I have to say, though, uh, extraordinary sunblock he's got on his face there. 
Well, I'll tell you what, STD, we could be entering a crucial passage of play now because here comes the birthday cake. Now, how's this young man going to respond to this challenge, mate? How indeed, how indeed. Well, I'm going to bring in our regular statistician, Phil Brindle, now. Afternoon, STD. Afternoon to you, Phil. Do you have the figures for how long it's taken little Billy to blow out the candles on his cake over the last few years? I probably do. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just that I think our listeners will be interested to... Absolutely. Uh, Quite right. Just give me two minutes. Yeah, so, anyway, um, uh, Glenn, you got to look at the cake earlier, I believe. What, what did you make of it? Well, that's right, mate. It looks to have a very dry surface for me. <laughs> There's already huge cracks opening up, and you know what? I get the feeling that it may well turn later on. <laughs> OK, well, the candles are lit. Let's see how little Billy performs under this intense pressure. Oh, ho! Well. Oh, ho! That is a mighty blow! And it's six! It's six! <laughs> Unfortunately, Billy is actually seven, so there is still one candle left to light. <laughs> yeah, but Clapper, I reckon he should be able to knock that off, no trouble. Absolutely, he should, but no, wait, he's not, Glenn. He's not, because it started to rain here, and the last candle has gone out by itself. The figures for Billy blowing out his birthday cake, STD. Billy is a medium-fast blower. <laughs> He's currently averaging 3.56 grams of spittle per blow. <laughs> you might also like to know that he's had 18 biscuits and six Cokes today, which goes some way to explaining why he's running around like a maniac. <laughs> Free kick here on the edge of the Hertha Berlin penalty area. Four men in the Berlin Wall. And what's this? David Hasselhoff is climbing onto the Berlin Wall and giving an impromptu concert. Bit of a mix-up here, surely? <laughs> So, as the World Swimming Championships start this weekend, former British Olympic swimmer Mark Foster has come out and said that modern high-tech performance-enhancing swimsuits are ruining the sport by taking away the level playing field. Now, instinct tells me that taking away any sort of field can only be a good thing in swimming. And so, <laughs> here to put the case for these extraordinary garments is the leading designer, Max Bavaria. Um, Max, welcome. Good evening, Gary. <laughs> so, um, swimmers say your suits are making the sport unfair. What do you say to that, Max? Let me ask you this, Gary. You sit down to watch the swimming, possibly at tea time with an elderly relative. <laughs> do you want to see eight enormous, completely naked men with no body hair bent over, ready to dive into a pool? <laughs> well, well, of course I don't. Ah, so you agree that we need swimsuits? Well... In that case, what is wrong with making those suits as good as they can possibly be? My swim racer reduces drag, allows better oxygen flow to the muscles, and retails at a mere £25,000. <laughs> Flippers not included. <laughs> I mean, swimming shouldn't all be about technology. We, we don't want it going the same way as, say, motor racing or snooker. <laughs> Listen, Gary, suit development is not new. Mm. Even as far back as 1963, I helped a Frenchman break the 100 metres freestyle world record by designing my revolutionary bungee suit. Bungee suit? Yeah. His trunks were attached to one end of the pool using a long length of elastic. <laughs> when he got to the turn, they trained him back on the second leg with tremendous force. Mm. So, so how come I've never heard of this bungee suit, then? Why don't they all wear them? Well, although the return length was exceedingly fast, the outward leg was much, much <laughs> slower. <laughs> and after that, you were pinged back with such force that your legs were instantly broken by the finish wall. <laughs> But there are no such problems with my next generation suit. I call it the Lycra Moses. Lycra Moses? A suit so waterproof that the pool literally parts in front of you. <laughs> and you run along the bottom like a latter day saviour of the Israelites. Although. <laughs> Although I may have to stop at that one. Why is that? Because everyone knows that there is no running at the swimming baths, Gary. <laughs> or heavy petting, sadly, which really put the kibosh on my two-man Kama Sutra body stocking. <laughs> it would have changed the way we watched the relay forever. Mm. <laughs> Max Bavaria, thank you very much for coming on the programme. Now, the News of the World phone-tapping scandal has shocked many. I haven't been so shocked since Max Mosley invited me round for a roast and all I got was food. 
Well, our journalist integrity correspondent, Lawrence Howarth, has been looking into this uh, for us. Uh, Lawrence? Yeah, thanks, Gary. Many have observed the behaviour of the news of the world with horror. Uh, tapping the phones of the rich and the powerful. It's disgraceful. And then not telling us what they actually heard. The killjoys. <laughs> but worry no more, Gary, because I've got the story. I've heard the actual tapes. But, L Lawrence, I've got to protest. Stories obtained through such dubious means have no place here at the BBC. It's good stuff, Gary. <laughs> OK, what have you got? Right, first of all, um, <laughs> I have just been handed the answer phone tapes of Sue Barker. Oh, Lord. Uh, now, I haven't actually had a chance to listen yet, but... Um, look, look, there's no reason for us to intrude. Um, Sue's a colleague, and her privacy... But, uh, but I, I, I thought probably the best place to have the first listen would be, you know, live oh, on air. No. So, uh, oh. play the tape. Hello, Sue, it's, uh, it's Gary. Can you give me a call when you've got a minute? Thanks, bye. Hello, Sue, it's Gary. Um, give us a call when you've got a minute, can you? Bye. <laughs> Hi, Sue, it's, it's Gary. Uh, give me a call when you... Yeah, well, perhaps we should fast-forward a little bit. <laughs> Hi, Sue, it's Gary. I'm um, not sure if you got my message before. Um, I, I didn't hear back from you. I was trying to get the old Wimbledon crowd back together this Friday night to, to see the new Transformers movie. <laughs> Michael Stick says he might be up for it. A anyway, give me a call when you've got a minute. Bye. Uh, it's Gary, by the way. <laughs> Look, Sue's just a colleague, and I... No, uh, hang on a minute. I think there are actually more. Yep. Hello, Sue, it's Gary. Um, you'd have enjoyed the film, uh, I think. Uh, Sticky couldn't make it in the end, so it was just me. <laughs> we had a great time. Basically, it turns out, thousands of years before Optimus Prime and the other Transformers arrived on Earth. <laughs> Hello, Sue, it's, it's Gary again. Um, I, I don't know how far I got before I was cut off. Um, anyway, basically, there was a race of ancient Transformers who scoured the universe. And, uh, and that's the lot. Mm. <laughs> Any comment, Gary? Lawrence, you're, you're missing the, the really important part of the story here. What's that? I'd have thought it was obvious. Thousands of years ago, there was a race for Transformers who scoured the universe. Yeah, well, OK, I'm going to stop you there. Uh, Gary Richardson, I pity you. Thank you very much for coming on the show. <laughs> You join us here for the true sport of kings, ground swapping. <laughs> Your wife's so easy, she could be the phoning question on a daytime television show. <laughs> no, that's not what I said to Peter Andre at a recent charity dinner. <laughs> but an example of the insults cricketers throw at each other on the field. It's one part of the game which the England management setup is taking more and more seriously. So much so that my next guest was recently appointed as England's first ever specialist sledging coach. Please welcome Sandra Cook. G'day, Gary. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I've, uh, I've always wanted to meet the Today programme's buffoon in residence. <laughs> that's, not, that's not very nice. Well, no, of course it wasn't. I, I was sledging you, Gary. You know, trying to psych you out, make you feel small. <laughs> Although, in your case. Yeah, Sandra, I. <laughs> Sandra, I can't help noticing that while you may be working with the England team, you'd appear to be Australian. Wow, not much gets past you, does it, Gary? Uh, tell me, out of interest, what are you going to do for a brain when John Prescott wants his ass back? <laughs> you're, you're really good at your job, aren't you? Thank you, Gary. Yes, I am the best. Mm. How, how have the team responded to your methods? It's been slow going, to be honest. Uh, sledging is a two-way process, of course, so I've started off by sledging them to see how they'd respond. Uh, I told Alistair Cook his breath was so bad he should cover his helmet grill with cling film. <laughs> but uh, all he came back at me with was a slightly contemptuous look. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's not going to wash with the Aussies. Everyone looks at us like that. <laughs> but uh, then the other day, he did make a rude comment about my mother. Mm. Did he say he'd slept with her? No, he said she made disappointing pastry. <laughs> Any other breakthroughs? Uh, yeah, I've actually had some success with the England captain himself. Why, Andrew Strauss, formerly of Radley College, Durham University. I, I can't think of anyone less likely to sledge. Ah, nevertheless, there he was on the second morning of the first test, sledging away. Although I must admit that he did insist on doing his sledging in the form of a poem. A poem? <laughs> How did it go? <clears throat> Dear Simon Katich, I'd say good day, but I rather wish you'd go away. And my sources tell me, true and sure, your sister Katich is a total whore. <laughs> it's disgraceful. Yeah, look at the results, Gary. Now, Simon Katich scored 122. Or to put it another way, he was only Australia's third highest scoring batsman. Mm, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, this has been an absolutely fascinating insight. Uh, just finally, actually, do you think you could teach me to sledge? Oh, of course, Gary. Um, first of all, let's see your form. Come on, insult me. Um, your hands are quite large. <laughs> that, that's pathetic. Uh, try again. I mean, really unleash your inner bile, Gary. Or as I like to call you, the poor man's Jeff Stelling. Mm. <laughs> Chuck something real hard at me. I, I, I don't want to. Think, think where we are, Sandra. Ugh, it's all right, Gary. After all, you know the saying, what happens in the BBC recording studio stays in the BBC recording studio. <laughs> It gets broadcast to the entire nation. Oh, you're just chicken. Scared I'll be too much for you, hey? Hey? Yeah, you washed-up Andy Murray-obsessed cretin. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Yeah, come on, do it! OK, you're a disgrace to all things sporting. You have one shot at life, and you, madam, have failed magnificently to be anything more than a spiritual parasite. A parasite! <laughs> uh, how was that? <laughs> Uh, right, um... You are horrible. <laughs> right, um, Sandra Cook, thank you very much for coming on the programme. <laughs> well, apparently, if you don't give disturbed people an outlet, the pressure builds up inside them and they just explode. Personally, I think we should let them. But others suggest the Look Away Now rant line. <laughs> all we've got time for. Uh, this is the last in the present series of Look Away Now, but there's lots of sporting events coming up, of course, over the summer. The Swimming World Championships start this weekend. The British team will be trying to snatch gold in Rome, although how Michael Caine's going to get those three minis into a swimming pool, I'm not sure. <laughs> in August, it's the start of a new Premier League season. Then in September, if you're Burnley, it's the end of the Premier League season. <laughs> And, of course, there are four more Ashes test matches to look forward to, unless you're the England team. Bye-bye. <laughs> look Away Now is presented by Gary Richardson, with Lawrence Howarth, Dave Lamb, Richie Webb, Miles Jupp and Catherine Jakeways, with special guests Sue Barker and Sarah Kendall. It was written by the cast, Danielle Ward, Humphrey Carr, David Reed, Gareth Gwynn, John Luke Roberts, Simon Littlefield and James Sherwood. With additional material by Colin Birch, Paul Hennell, Richard Ward and Andrew Douglas. The music was by Richie Webb and Look Away Now is produced by Ben Walker. <laughs> If you've enjoyed the Look Away Now podcast, you may also enjoy the Sports Week podcast, a roundup of the week's sporting issues with Gary Richardson over on Five Live. You'll find information about this and other podcasts from BBC Radio's 4 and 5 Live at bbc.co.uk forward slash podcasts.